We're going to have Mr. Cosmos come on up and we're going to have our scripture reading from Romans chapter 5 and then we'll have some teaching from the Word of God. Are we all set? Let us pray first. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is a light unto our past. For you are the light of the world. May you teach us and guide us through your Holy Spirit as you open your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through, the, through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many die by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses justification. For if, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundance provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that, just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Our text begins with the word therefore. And this is a beautiful transition that tells us that everything we've said up until now, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, is being summarized, and we're switching on to what comes next in our thought process. Therefore, what is it that immediately precedes this? We can take a look back a couple of verses, and we can see in verses 24 and 25 of what was just before us, 
It says, to those of us who believe, I'm halfway through verse 24, to those of us who believe in him, in Jesus Christ, who raised Jesus from the, uh, our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. There are things we've already learned in chapters 1 and 23. It says, because of sin, mankind is under the wrath of God. Is everyone listening? Because of our sin, we, all of us, were under God's wrath. Man cannot be made right through our own works, our own rituals, everything that you would ever try. Listen, the things that you would try to do to be made right with God did not and will not work. We are under God's wrath because of our sin. God caused Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for our sin through his death on the cross. That's what God has done for us. And we are called to believe this message. And so through faith to receive salvation. We are called to believe and receive this salvation. And in fact, in the last verses of chapter 4, it says, we have received this. Therefore, therefore, we are in a unique position because we have received this and believed all of this. And that's what brings us to chapter 5. Now that we are in this place, what can be said is true about us? The first thing that is true about us is that we have peace with God. And that's where we begin here at chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me see if I can say something about that. It says we have been justified. I said something about that earlier in previous weeks, but we'll say it again. When you stand before a judge, you will have one of two things that will happen. You will either be condemned, meaning you are found guilty, or you will be justified, meaning that you are not guilty, and the guilt of that, the weight of it, is not laid on you. Do you understand this? Now, every one of us is guilty before God because of our sin. But because of Jesus Christ having paid for our sin, everyone who is believing in the Lord Jesus can be justified, can be made right before God, can be declared righteous and not guilty before God. This is the case for each one who is trusting in Jesus Christ. And it says, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. What does that mean? Well, this peace with God means several things. First of all, we get an outward peace, meaning peace in our relationship with God himself. Peace in that relationship with God, meaning that we were enemies with God. We were under God's wrath. We were at war with God, and now we're no longer at war with God. We have peace with God. But there's also an inward peace. I need you to listen to this. Almost every person has experienced a kind of turmoil in his heart that says, something's not right in my life. Something isn't the way it ought to be. Something feels wrong, and there is no peace. And then, for those who receive Jesus Christ as Savior, one of the very first things that they experience, usually, is an inflooding of peace. There is something where they say, I don't know how I went from being so anxious and distressed to having this inward peace, but something happened and it was given to me through God when I accepted Jesus as Savior. It says, now that you have this faith in Jesus and you have been declared righteous, you have peace with God. What else do we have? We move on to verse 2. We have peace, and then it says, verse 2, through whom, through Jesus Christ, through whom, we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. By this grace in which we now stand. We stand, verse 2, in grace. What does this mean? We have a place that is a secure place where we can stand before God. This would be something that is not common. Listen, this is not something that would be common for people when they would think of kings and rulers. If you were an ordinary person, you couldn't just walk in and stand before that king. 
you wouldn't be invited into the palace in the first place. And if you did come into the palace, you wouldn't stand. You would bow and rubble and do other things. And you would have no place to stand there. And you would have no assurance that you'd be welcome the next day. You've read enough history to know that there would be noblemen and others who thought they could stand before the king. And then the king's whims changed. And they would be banished or executed the next day. You know what I'm talking about? Because of the grace of God, we not only have peace with God, but we can stand in that grace before God and can continue to stand before Him eternally, and we will never be evicted. Do you understand this? This is meant to be good news. This is our position for those of us who are in Christ. We have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Here's a third thing. We rejoice in that hope. There is a joyful expectation of the future. And that future is going to be interesting because the glory of God, which is now veiled to us, we don't see him in his current glory, will be revealed to us and made perfectly plain, and the glory that he wants us to have one day in our glorified bodies will be revealed also, and we can rejoice in the glory of heaven. Continuing in verse 3, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Pause there. Up until now, this sounded pretty good. We have lots of grace that's been given to us, and we have lots of glory that's coming, and we rejoice in all of these things. And now it's that we also rejoice in our suffering. Why is that? A couple of reasons. One, of course, is, and listen, If I am linked with Jesus Christ, and I am now in God's care, but I previously been God's enemy, and I live amongst people who are God's enemies, and I defect from the enemy side and go over to God, but I still live amongst those who are God's enemies, what is likely to happen? I will receive some opposition and even suffering from those who are not God's friends or God's enemies. Is this true? If, if I joined up with an army and I moved freely amongst the enemy and they all welcomed me and said how oh, pleased they were to see me, something would not be right. Did you understand that? The Bible says if there is sufferings, if there is persecution, if there are things that are coming against you, that still is something that you can rejoice in because it demonstrates that you are no longer on the side of those who are God's enemies. This demonstrates who you are and what your identity is. We rejoice in our sufferings, verse 3, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance then produces character, and character leads to it produces hope. Here we have those three things in order. First of all, suffering produces perseverance. That is, it produces never greater ability to stick with the truth, to stand firm no matter what the circumstances are. If you suffer a little bit and stand, then the next time you can suffer a little more and stand, and then you can suffer a little more and stand, and after a while you say, it doesn't matter what they throw at me, I'm going to be able to stand for the Lord. I will persevere. And that perseverance produces character. That word character might mean something like maturity. We are looking for those who grow to full maturity in Christ. And having suffered such and persevering through, you come to greater and greater character or maturity. And the character then finally produces hope. One way that it produces hope is this. I was speaking with a man a few days ago who reflected back on what he was like when he was unsaved, and then what he was like when he was a first a Christian, and then what God has done with him since then, and how he has grown so much, and God has brought him such a distance. And when you look at your life and say, God has brought me this far, does that give you hope for what lies ahead in the future? It does for me. It says to me, well, if God has over these decades done this much, he's not going to drop me now. There's not going to be a hopeless future now. There is instead hope that lies ahead. And so these things come in order. I want you to know something. Are you all listening, church? 
if you follow Jesus Christ, you have all of the glory that I've been describing, but you will be assuredly having some of the sufferings that go into this as well. It will happen. There is no one, even in human endeavors, if I join an army, I will be put through a boot camp, which will not be fun. If I join a sports team, I will be put through rigorous drills that will be meant to cause me to persevere so that I will improve and be able to have the maturity I need. If I join an academic venture in school, I will be put through things that are meant to be hard. Do you understand this? God is no different. If you will follow the Lord, there will be sufferings and difficulties so that you will become mature and eventually so that you will grow into a place and have a great hope. And all of this we are to be rejoicing in. This hope is not disappointing. Verse 5. Hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given us. In addition to all of the other things that God has done bringing about this maturity and hope, He says, I have one other thing I'll do for you. Listen now. He says, I have one other thing I'll do for you. Through the Holy Spirit, I will take bucketfuls of my love and I will pour that out into your heart so that you will have a love for God and so that you will have a love for other people. And that love for other people will be useful to you in all kinds of circumstances so that you can love those that love you and more importantly, you can love those who don't love you. You can have God's love fill in your heart in every situation. God can do this for you. Lord says that you have all of that as part of your condition. Namely, you have peace with God and receive all of these things. The second thing the Lord says about us is that we will be saved from wrath, starting here at verse 6. Our present place of peace, now paired with a future privilege, we will be spared from God's wrath on the day of judgment. You see, it says here in verse 6, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Still reading on. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? I'd like us to focus for a moment there on verse 9, and then we'll back up. Since we've been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? That is wonderful. It says, you have been saved already through the blood of Christ, and you will be saved from God's day of wrath and judgment if you are in Christ. This is a privilege that you have. Leading up to an expression of that, the Apostle Paul gives us some of the things that built up, starting in verse 6. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for wicked people, and that means us. The next verse says, nobody else dies for wicked people. Somebody, it says in the next verse, might voluntarily die for someone they loved a lot who was righteous. You think of secret service men who are willing to die for the president if need be. You think of people who are willing to die for someone who is noble. You think of parents who are willing to die for their children if they must. But I don't know of any volunteers who say, I'd like to die for somebody who is wicked and who is destroying others. And yet, while we were wicked, while we were unrighteous, while we were sinful, Christ died for us. That is a remarkable thing. God demonstrates, verse 8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, while we were still wicked men, Christ died for us. Now then, since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? 
we can demonstrate it this way. It's a how much more kind of a chart we have here. Looking on the left side of it, if because of sin we were God's enemies, how much more because of Christ are we reconciled as God's friends? We were once God's enemies, and Christ has done his work so that we become by God's friends. And if we are presently reconciled through Jesus' death, how much more will you be saved from future wrath through Jesus' life? What Jesus does for us is he not only moves us to a place of being no longer God's enemies, but he moves us further to a place where we will be delivered from all future wrath and we will be eternally with him. And so let's see what it says here. If, verse 10, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? That's the graph we have behind me here. Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. I will say a word about this. Those who are truly grasping what I am saying, who truly understand through a spiritual glimpse of the hell that lay before us and are being delivered from that and being given instead the glory that lies ahead of us. If we come to understand all of this, we rejoice, we worship, we give praise to God for all of this. When we come together, I have my children say to me sometimes, they say, Daddy, is there anything that's going to be special happening at church today? And I think they want to know, is there going to be a special kind of snack? Is there going to be a special game afterward? Is there going to be a special kind of a song or some other thing? And I say to them, we are going to be doing something very special. And they say, oh, what is it? And I say, we're going to be worshiping the God of the universe and thanking him for what Christ has done on the cross. And they look for a moment like, oh, is that all? <laughs> But you and I know, listen, you and I know that if we have grasped what Christ has done for us, we rejoice in this persistently, always, and it's an exciting thing to come and worship, and we don't need any deeper reason to worship the Lord and praise Him. Do it. We can begin on that point and stay on that point and worship for these things, and it is exciting, and it is wonderful. And so it says here in the Scriptures again, Verse 11, we rejoice in God through Jesus, who has done all this, who has reconciled us to Christ. And that leads us to the third part of our message here today. How could the death of Jesus accomplish so much for us? This is something that some have wondered. I'll give you an illustration of this. My mother grew up in a home where the gospel was never explained or known. The closest thing that she remembers during her growing up years, this is a teenager, there was a very small sign, a billboard, I guess, not a large one, that was in her part of town. And it said something like, Jesus died for our sins. That's what it said. And she couldn't understand, having read that, how somebody dying thousands of years ago had anything to do with her at all. And what difference that would make to her or how that would have any effect on her sense. Do you understand this? It made no sense at all to her. It wasn't until several years later where someone explained that only through the shedding of blood, only through sacrifice, could there be a forgiveness of sins. And for so many years that had been done by animal sacrifices and other things, and that finally Jesus came to be the final perfect sacrifice for us. And that Jesus did that for all people, including her, he wasn't understood by her. What Jesus did accomplished so much for so many, and she didn't understand it. And some of Paul's readers would want to know, how is it that this has happened, that the death of Jesus Christ has done so much for us. Well, the remainder of this chapter, the rest of this chapter, Paul walks it all out for us. Starting here at verse 12. Therefore, 
just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men, because all <coughs> sinned. This is interesting. He says, I want to explain to you what Jesus has done for us, but I have to back up to the beginning. Eternal death came to all people through one man. And that one man would be Adam. Just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men, because all sin, for before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin was not taken into account when there was, or there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking command, as did Adam, who was the pattern of the one to come. What is this all telling us? Did Adam, or his son Seth, or his son, or his son, or his son, did they have the law that was written out by Moses of all of God's commandments? Did they have that? No, they didn't. That came many years later. But they still sinned. And I want you to know something. Sin has been a built-in feature of our lives ever since Adam sinned. And we don't need a list of laws or an explanation either of how to sin or what sin is in order to sin and to be guilty of sin. Let me explain that to you. Parents, with your youngest children, does anyone need to teach them how to disobey? No, it comes as a built-in feature. <laughs> What is more, in general, no one has to teach them that it is wrong to disobey. They sense that and they know that. No one needs to teach them how to lie or how to sneak something. They will creep up into the kitchen and try to steal something from the refrigerator without anyone telling them it's wrong. They know that they shouldn't be doing it. There is something in our hearts that is built in. And it started with Adam's sin, and for generations, people continued to sin, knowing they were sinning, even before the law of Moses was put in place. As we'll find in the rest of the chapter, the law of Moses was given so that people could see more clearly all of their sin, but they already knew, they already knew what they were doing. Sin entered the world through that one man, Adam, and death came through that sin. The concept the doctrine that we're discussing right now is a doctrine called the doctrine or concept of original sin. And by original sin, we're not thinking so much just of any one sin, although we could think of Adam's first sin. But we're talking about a doctrine that says that you and I were born with original sin. You and I had that sin of nature built into us. It was not optional equipment, it was standard equipment when we were born. And it's something that continues on. We have been under this trouble of original sin, and we become fallen in our nature. We're pervaded by sin, and this is 100% true. This is true of all people, and we inherited this from Adam. Now, somebody might say, listen now, someone might say, well, how does Adam's sin have anything to do with me? And I'll tell you something. There's a concept, and that, that concept is that Adam was something like a federal representative of ours, and in his sin, he brought us all into this condition. Maybe I can give you an illustration. Is everybody listening? Let us suppose that tomorrow, our president declared that we were, as a nation, at war with another country. Are you with me on this so far? Our president declares that we are at war with another nation. Do you know what that means? That means that you, personally, are a part of the nation that is at war with that other country. Not one of you can say, if that inv nation invades, don't blame me, that was somebody else who did that, because you have been represented by someone who made that decision. Do you understand this? There are people who will make decisions, and it affects you. Adam made a decision. And it affected not only him, but everybody who inherited that from him. And so you and I inherited this through Adam. Does everybody get this? 
This is the concept of original sin. This is the concept of our inheriting something from another, from Adam. And to deny that would be the same as to deny that you inherited anything from your parents. When I look at most of you, I see something of your parents in you. Isn't this true? Physical features, manners in which you talk, temperament, all kinds of things. Abilities. You inherit certain things from those who came before you. And each of us has inherited this concept of original sin, this, this, this fact of original sin. But, even as much as sin came through one man, namely Adam, we are saved through one man, namely Jesus Christ. Verse 15. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Now it says here that there was one man, Adam, who trespassed against God and brought all of this death and all of this sin and all this mayhem. But there is something else which happens to one man, namely Jesus Christ, which is greater. And the greaterness of it is lined out in at least three comparisons. The gift is not like the trespass. Here's the first comparison. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? There's a comparison between the judgment of death and the grace gift. It says there was a big judgment that came from God because of what Adam did, but there is a great grace that comes from God by what Jesus has done. You all get this? Do you see the comparison? There's a difference. And then there's another point of comparison that we come to in verse 16 again. The gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. Well, this is interesting. It says, how many sins did it take to bring judgment to all people? One. One. One sin. That was enough. Interestingly, when Jesus came and brought his gift of grace to all who would believe in him, that gift can be applied to the lives of people even after not just one sin, but a zillion sins. Sins upon sins upon sins upon sins upon sins. And this grace gift is stronger. It can be applied to all of that sin, and you may be saved. Do you understand this? Somebody here might be tempted to think, God could not forgive me. Look at all of what I have done. And this tells us that the mercy of God, the grace of God, the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ is greater than the condemnation that comes through our trespass through sin. Greater than not just one sin, but greater than all sin, many sins, lots of sins. There is a big difference in this respect. And then a third difference. Verse 17, for if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? And now the juxtaposition is this, that uh, death coming through Adam and life coming through Jesus Christ eternal death being poured out to so many through what happened through Adam, and eternal life coming through Jesus Christ. I can line up this thing. Because of Adam's trespass and the fall, we get judgment and condemnation and death. Because of God's gift, Jesus' crucifixion for us, we get grace, justification, and life. Do you see this? We're making a direct comparison between these two. And so we come to the last part of our message. You have one of two paths you're on, either death through Adam or life through Christ. All of us start on the first of those paths, death through Adam. Every single one of us starts again. Death through Adam. But for those who receive Jesus Christ, we have life through Christ. Starting at verse 18. Consequently, 
That's a big word, which means I'm going to summarize it all and give you the conclusion of what we've done here in this chapter. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass, one sin, was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness, that is, Jesus' death for us, was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The emphasis here is on one act. On the one act. There is one act that uh, Adam did that brought death and judgment to us all, and there was one act, namely Jesus laying down his life for us, that has been the thing that brings life to us all. The contrast is made, the disobedience of one man, and he became sinners. Through the obedience of one man, verse 19, many were made righteous. I have a couple of things that are application range that I want to point out to you, and I need you to hear this. The first and most important application, let us listen. The first and most important application is that your life is going to be identified with one of these two paths and one of these two men. Either you will be identified as a son or daughter of Adam, and you will be under God's wrath and judgment because of your sin. That is your condition. That is the condition you're born in, and that's the condition you will remain in. And any amount of attempt on your own part to nullify that is useless. You will be still in that place unless you receive Jesus Christ to save you. At that point, in receiving Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, the righteousness of Jesus Christ will be applied to your life. When God looks at you, He won't see your standing, your merit, your goodness. He will instead see that of Jesus. And He will say, all of what you were is washed away, and what Jesus is is now applied to you. My urging for each of you today is that you would receive Jesus Christ as Savior. Someone here who says, well, I don't know if it's that important. The Bible tells us that this is of vital importance because without this you remain under God's wrath. Without this you remain in a position where you will not have peace with God. Without this you will be in a position where your life will be headed toward eternal death. The alternative is to receive eternal life and to gain peace with God and to have the glory that's being described here. One of those two is what faces you. I would urge you with all of my heart to put your faith in Jesus Christ and to receive his gift of salvation today. Not another day, but today. This is the day that God, if he has made this clear to you, for you to then receive such salvation. I will mention another point of application that I think is useful to us, and that is this. The Bible is very clear on the fact that the fall of Adam and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ are significant because they are real events that changed the course of human history. This is not mythology, this is not allegory, this is not poetry, this is not fiction. It used to be popular to say that the creation account in Genesis was something like an allegory with symbols and so on. But, increasingly, that's becoming very clear that that's not the case. Biology and science teaches us increasingly that that can't be the case. I'll tell you one reason why. With genetics, we find that the DNA of all people are so closely linked it's established that we have all a common ancestor. You understand that? It's not like sort of people slowly evolved from some luck in lots of different places and lots of different ways and really have no connection to each other. It's pretty well determined by now that genetically we all go back to the very same ancestor. And logic dictates that whatever ancestor we had would have been male, and a female at the same time. If you don't have them at the same time, not much happens. 
And so there was an original pair as described in the scripture. And theology insists that the means of salvation was the cross of Christ. And if that didn't happen, that Jesus didn't die for our sins, then we're still all dead in our sin. It's a historical fact. And Jesus and his apostles put the life and work of Adam at the beginning into historical pairing with the life of Jesus. And so we can put it this way. If the work of Jesus Christ is a fact, as Romans 5 says, then the life and actions of Adam were a historical fact, as it also says. Do you understand this? Anyone who comes to you and says, well, I think I want to be a Christian who believes in the things of Jesus, but not in any of the Old Testament things, or not in the things of Genesis, or not in things about creation. There is trouble along these lines. Because the words of Jesus and the words of his apostles say, these two events were historical. These two events fit together in the one brings judgment and death to all men, and the other brings eternal life to all. Do you understand this? So it is worthwhile for us to notice this in Romans chapter 5 and apply this to our thinking of the Bible as a whole. What the Bible presents is historical in Romans 5. It's historical and true. And then we complete our text starting in Peter verse 20. The law was added, someone might say, well, okay. Adam sinned, we all became sinners, Jesus died and saved us. What was the person, purpose of the law? Why did Moses give us this law? Isn't this so that we can be saved by obeying it? And God says, no, well, that wasn't the main purpose. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, so that you might know how deeply you are a sinner. Do you get this? The law was added not that you could be made pure. No one is made pure. We shared this example last week. He said that the law is a little bit like an x-ray machine. It shows what's going wrong inside of us. It's good to get an x-ray and see what's wrong inside of you, but nobody is healed by that x-ray. It's good to have the law and see what's going wrong inside of us, but no one is made pure by having that law. The law was added so the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. The more and more sin that we saw in our lives, the more that Jesus Christ is able to then cover all of that sin. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin leads to death. Grace leads to life. And as we get to chapter 6, it tells us that even in spite of all of that compounding of sin, there is grace sufficient to cover all of it. And because of all the grace that is sufficient to cover all of us, there are things about how we are going to live in that position of grace for the years that we live on this earth. And that brings us to chapter 6 of Romans. Romans is a great, great book describing to us the gospel and what it is for us to live in light of the gospel. And I'm thankful to be going through this with you. We come to chapter 6 next week. I'm going to invite everyone to stand with me together right now.